Hey guys, Nick here from 4PlayerNetwork.com and host of 4Player Podcast. God damn, 2017 was a good year. Let me tell you why. These are my 10 favorite games of the year. My number 10 game of 2017 is actually a game I didn't get to start until very, very late in the year, which is very unfortunate because that game is Persona 5. And as many of you out there, I'm sure, are already aware, Persona 5 is a massive game. It is a 60 to 100 hour experience at least, and I've barely scratched the surface of it. With that said, I do really appreciate this game for allowing me to kind of get outside of my comfort zone, so I'm really enjoying it in that sense. I'm not a huge fan of anime, um, so I'm not really entirely sure why this game appeals to me, but for some reason it scratches an itch that I occasionally need scratched, and that's great. I also haven't played a turn-based RPG, like a traditional turn-based RPG, in quite some time, uh, which is crazy considering when I first started pl playing games, that's like a, the genre that I kept coming back to over and over and over again. In terms of mechanics, though, I think Persona 5 is quite traditional and safe, you know, in terms of JRPG mechanics, at least. Um, there's obviously a few notable exceptions, and honestly, some of those exceptions just are maybe the reason why this game is, is farther down on my list. The things like the system that allows you to, to talk to Personas to actually recruit them, I think is kind of broken, or at least not clear and, and, and very hard to understand. But it's but the the things that that are traditional that are common in the genre I think work incredibly well in this game, uh, and it's all tied together using this like really consistent beautiful art style, this anime art style that is just dripping from every corner of this game. Everything from transitioning from combat to exploration and vice versa, to pulling out your cell phone to have conversations with people, to moving around the world using the quick travel map like. Everything is so smooth and beautiful, and it's all accentuated by this really charming, upbeat soundtrack that I just can't help but get... It, it almost puts me in a trance when I play the game. There's been multiple times I've been playing this game, and I find myself, like, snapping my fingers or, or bobbing my head, and then, like, suddenly it's been four or five hours, and I'm like, where did the time go? I've just been... I've been grinding in a, in a dungeon for three or four hours, and haven't really been doing much to progress the story, but... The music and, and the visual style of the game just pushes everything forward so smoothly, I, I hardly even notice it. And I think that's that's a testament to how well this game is designed and built. I also get really, really into the social mechanics. This is an Atlas RPG, after all. Uh, it's why I liked Catherine. It's why I, I, it, you know, it's one of the many reasons why I love Mass Effect. I love cultivating relationships and building friendships with characters and, and, and obviously romancing characters. That's, that's a super addicting element of these games that I can't get enough of. Um, and I've only kind of scratched the surface of that aspect of the game too, but I, it's already starting to get its hooks in me. I don't even know who I'm going to romance yet. There's already like two or three characters that I can easily see myself wanting to romance in this game, and I think that's a really unique thing that not a lot of games allow you to really get involved in. I think that's really cool. But yeah, I mean, everything from top to bottom in this game is just really fluid, really smooth. It's and it's and honestly, it's the Persona is one of like the shining beacons of like traditional JRPG design. Um, these days, at least on a mainstream level, I think, I think it deserves a lot of credit for that. So it may be outside of my comfort zone, but it's also a game that I'm that I'm tremendously happy that I got around to playing in 2017. Uh, and despite the fact that I haven't finished it, it made my list. It's my number 10 game. Near Automata is my number nine game of 2017. First and foremost, I think it's super important that I point out the the impact that 2017 
had on this franchise. The fact that I can even call it a franchise now is absolutely incredible. Just, you know, just a few years ago when, this, when the original game came out, uh, last generation actually, when it, when it came out, you know, nobody ca nobody knew about it, nobody cared about it. It had this, like, it cultivated this, like, small cult following, uh, and it was really appreciated by certain corners of, of, of the community, but, like, it was, la you know, it had these weird story quirks, you know, weird characters, it had kind of a muted color palette, not a super appealing visual style. Um, mechanically speaking, it was strange as well. It just, it kind of lacked anything that gave it this, like, mainstream appeal. But with this game, the team at Platinum Games and Square Enix, along with Yoko Taro, they managed to accomplish a level of polish that, you know, just wasn't really possible the first time around with the original game. Um, this game came together so beautifully, and I think a lot of that, for me at least, was a combination of both the music and the atmosphere and the world design. Uh, I really liked the world itself was actually like, it was like an open world, but it was a smaller open world that was like punctuated with unforgettable areas and moments. It was actually kind of, for me, it felt a lot like maybe Ocarina of Time, because it was all built around this like central field-like area, and then all kind of all around the outskirts of that field were like these really memorable places that you got to go to. For me, the first time I came across that uh, like dilapidated theme park or, or, or like Disney World essentially was was really mad, like one of my favorite moments of the entire year. G getting to visit that forest village that was just comprised of all these happy-go-lucky robots that just wanted nothing more than to live in peace with the other inhabitants of the planet. That, that was just really, really magical stuff. It told a fascinating story about humanity, or or what it means to be human, which made it, which was even more impactful when you think about the fact that it was essentially told from the eyes of someone who isn't actually human. It's not, you know, androids, artificial humans. Uh, the game had some of the best characters of the year as well, both main and supporting characters. Of course, I'm talking about 2B and 9S primarily. Um, those are both great characters on their own, but together, I think more importantly, they make a really great ensemble cast. Um, they have great dialogue, they have great touching moments together. Um, by far, some of the best moments in the game have to do with them and their interactions together. Of course, um, uh, there's also A2, Pascal, Emile, all great supporting characters for very different reasons. Of course, this is a Platinum Games game as well, so I can't not mention the combat, which was admittedly a little simple, but it was fun and it was, it was solidly crafted. Um, it may have been a little shallow, especially when compared to things like Bayonetta or Devil May Cry, but the feedback was nice, the systems were easy to learn, and they were unique. I liked the chipsets, especially, um, especially the way they were tied into the lore and how, since you're an android, you're actually swapping out these chipsets that take up certain amounts of your internal memory. Um, so choosing, you know, a more beneficial ability on your character would actually take up more memory and therefore leave you less space to assign other chipsets. I think that was a really cool spin on that whole system. The hacking was really cool as well. I think it maybe gets a little repetitive, especially in some of the other playthroughs um, later in the game where it becomes more prevalent. Uh, but that was cool, and it was it was definitely a nice break from the kind of the hack and slash action combat. But in the end, I just think it's really impressive to see how beautifully this this game ended up coming together. I think it maybe gets a little too much praise for having one of the best endings in a video game ever. I wouldn't really take it that far, but. You know, the character work is super solid. The, the Maybe the smaller stories they tell are, are maybe more successful than some of the grander uh, stories, which can get a little bit convoluted. But it definitely carries that, atmos that, that atmosphere and that tone and that just bizarreness that the first game had uh, into a really polished, well-made sequel. And I think everybody owes it to themselves to at least give this game a try. It's easily one of the most unique action games or RPGs um, on the market right now. And uh, that is why it's easily one of my favorite games of 2017. Hellblade Sinua's Sacrifice is a game that kind of came out of left field for me, but it still managed to land at my number 8 for the year. Um, I wasn't paying a whole lot of attention to it prior to its release, mainly because I wasn't really sure what this game actually was. It was kind of confusing. It seemed like Ninja Theory was trying to do some kind of weird experiment, and, and it was going to end up being this, like, weird $15 budget experience, but what I ended up getting was kind of the opposite. It's like, it's like, it's almost like a triple A game, but they, but they managed to, to use all these really interesting development techniques to do it. And I don't, I think it's kind of weird to even talk about development when you're thinking about your favorite games of the year, but that does play a role in, in why I liked this game so much. I think it's super fascinating to see what they achieved with such strange uh, development techniques. 
But about the game itself, I, I, I think Senua's journey into hell is incredibly moving, um, especially when you tie it or when you look at it in terms of her struggles with mental illness. Um, throughout that entire game, I felt for her. I was super invested. Senua herself is this beautiful and incredibly well-executed character um, with tons of layers, but it's even more impressive given the development methods that were used to bring her to life. Like, <laughs> instead of hiring, you know, a professional actor, they recruited the, the, the woman who produces their video content on YouTube to play this character, and she knocks it out of the park. She's incredible. She's she's more expressive as a character than a lot of like big actors you see in like major motion pictures. It's it's kind of crazy. The game also has like incredible audio design and voice acting and performance capture. You you kind of just have to see it and hear it to believe it. Uh, especially like just the first five minutes of the game where Sinna was like rowing down this river while she like she's had, having this inner monologue. She's hearing these whispers of all these voices in her head, um, which are supposed to like represent her 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 you know her mental illness like. That is so well executed, and it's so chilling and haunting, especially you have to wear headphones when you play this game. I implore you, if you haven't played this game yet and you're thinking about it, don't be stupid. Put on headphones. It's incredible. In fact, some of the audio in this game goes a long way in making this game pretty much indistinguishable from some other AAA productions you see out there. I will be honest though, some of the core elements of the game, mechanically speaking, the combat and the puzzles, are a tad bit repetitive. They're cool, and they're fun, and the game is just short enough that they don't overstay their welcome, I think. Um, but the negatives were totally overshadowed for me by everything else this game does amazingly well. The world, the narrative, the audio, and even the ending. It lands the ending, which I think is rare in video games these days. It's, it's kind of like if Dante's Inferno was made again, but it was done right. Uh, it has these super striking like visual set pieces that are just burned into my brain. A lot of things that are kind of like stripped straight out of Dante's Inferno, but executed so much better. Of course, the kind of the big thing about this project is that Ninja Theory was set out to tell this like deeply personal story that also kind of said something about the realities of mental illness. And whether they succeeded at that, I'm not entirely sure. I'm not at all qualified to make that judgment. But the story they told is really, 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 really well executed and 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 super memorable. As a package, this game is super impressive. And as a game, and as an experiment in modern-day AAA game development, it's a hell of an achievement. It's only about five or six hours, and it's something that I implore every single one of you out there to try. Coming in at number seven is actually a, an original horror game that I don't think a lot of people actually played in 2017, which is understandable. 2017 was actually a really great year for horror games in general, or maybe horror sequels more accurately. But Little Nightmares is like this bizarre Tim Burton fever dream. Uh, it has a sense of mystery and foreboding that really felt fresh for the genre. Uh, you play as this little girl named Six who's who's trying to escape this giant ship, and all the while she's having these terrifying run-ins with the crew that run the ship, like the janitors, the cooks, uh, and even the guests. Thematically or, or, or tonally, it reminded me a lot of something like Beetlejuice, uh, or Spirited Away even, but it's darker than both of those things. I wouldn't necessarily describe it as like overtly scary. In fact, it, w it was it was kind of a relaxing game to play, but its atmosphere, like its tone and its atmosphere, was like super thick and like just really well executed. Um, it was actually one of the most memorable horror experiences I had all year, which is pretty pretty high praise considering we had games like The Evil Within 2, Resident Evil 7, Outlast 2. Like there's, like I said, it's been a pretty good year for the horror genre, but this game kind of uh, stood tall as one of my favorites of the year. I think it's I think it's a great game for anyone who really like appreciates the horror genre and wishes they could play more, but maybe is hesitant to because the games make them uh, anxious or, or, or scared. Not to imply that the game is not frightening or or is lacking in what people would expect from a horror game. Uh, it certainly is a, a very tense experience. In fact, a lot of the gameplay like set pieces that that are sprinkled throughout the game are actually very focused on on being chased or having to hide from something and trying to find you. Uh, and in that sense, it's all very tense, but it was also a game that I that I had no problem just chilling out and, and, and sitting in a dark room by myself playing. I think this game is also a perfect fit for the episodic structure that it's in. Every chapter is, is kind of bite-sized, it's about 45 minutes to an hour, and it focuses on a different part of the ship and a different monster that's kind of chasing you throughout. And each one kind of culminates in these like really wonderfully tense 
set piece moments uh, that I obviously don't want to spoil. I think they're fantastic, but the game is also kind of minimalistic in its presentation and play interaction. I think it has a really awesome and distinct visual style. Uh, it, like I said, I mentioned uh, Tim Burton earlier kind of, and, and Beetlejuice. It kind of reminds me of that part in the movie where they're like stretching their faces. Like, everyone's kind of made of clay, um, but it's also very dark and the lighting's very on point. I think I think it all comes together really, really beautifully. The game is a little bit short. It's only about three or four hours. Uh, maybe add another couple hours because of the DLC they're, they're still releasing to this day. Um, but it's short, but it's packed with some of my favorite moments of the year. Whether it's, you know, there's this moment where you're trying to, like, fetch this key from this bedroom while one of the off-duty chefs is sleeping in the room with you. But all it's, it's very stylized. So, like, all the furniture in the room, you're very small and everything else is huge. All the furniture is massive. So you actually have to, like, scale this... Um, this like chest of drawers to get to the top and then jump over to this shelf to pick up to try and like wiggle this key off this key rack all while this chef is sleeping in the room with you that, that stuff is really cool um, there's this like mad dash you have to make through the dining hall near the end of the game that is just I can't even I can't even I don't want to spoil this for you it's, it's fucking fantastic um, trying to avoid the janitor while he's he's blind but he's trying to he has these really long arms and he's trying to reach for you and under like reach under the bed to find you and stuff is really 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 cool and kind of nightmare fuel i love it overall the game is it's short and it's sweet but it's a must play for anyone who appreciates the horror genre like i said it's 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 something that's kind of low stress but it definitely still captures the essence of what makes horror so great especially in terms of video games uh, it's truly representative of the potential of variety that the genre holds oh 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 i almost forgot Last thing I want to say about this game, I almost completely forgot to mention it. The soundtrack is incredible. It's unlike anything I heard this year. Check it out. Truth be told, Hollow Knight would probably be much higher on my list if I actually had time to finish it. I was kind of holding out for a Switch version of the game, but that didn't come to pass, so I ended up having to start this game very late in the year, which is kind of one of my biggest regrets of the year, to be totally honest. And I'm going to try and keep this relatively short because I know this is going to get all kinds of praise from, from the other guys on the site here um, who all finished the game. What I can say is that Hollow Knight is like a dream combination of Metroidvania-style game design with this like dark, dreamlike quality of like a Souls game. And I think that is this magical combination that that is just so beautifully realized in this game. In fact, I've honestly barely glimpsed the, the magnitude of the beauty of this game. Um, I'm only about 15 hours into it, and I know there's so much left for me to see and, and explore. On a, on a mechanical level, I think this game has near-perfect character control. It demands precision of the player, which can honestly at times be frustrating, but I also respect it. I think it, I think it controls beautifully. Um, I like the character progression, which is spread out over a heftier amount of, of time than I, I guess I was expecting going into this game. Um, I spent the first five hours of the game kind of wondering, how the hell do I dash? Like, how do I move faster? And that was one of the first kind of abilities you, you unlock, but it definitely takes its time feeding you those things, which I think is great. It also kind of hinges upon how quickly you choose to explore the world, so, um, or, or, or how you go about exploring the world, because it's all very open as well, I think, which I think is fantastic. It, had, it created this like sense of desperation for finding new abilities, which made them that much more rewarding when you unlock them, and, I, and I'm looking forward to, to, to finding more of those abilities. This is all in relation especially to like some of these brutally challenging boss fights or, or platforming sequences throughout. That moment you unlock a new ability and you realize, oh my god, this is going to make things so much easier, is so rewarding. The notch system is actually really cool as well. I think it's a really cool spin on uh, what is essentially a loadout system for your character. Uh, for both passive and non-passive abilities, it's 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 super imperative to success. And like you're gonna, it's like sometimes you have to unequip a notch that you really love in order to equip another one to give you the upper hand in you know an upcoming boss fight. I think that's that's really cool. Um, over the years, though, I've I've really fallen in love with the 2D Metroidvania games thanks to games like Ori and the Blind Forest, Guacamelee, and of course uh, Super Metroid. But Hollow Knight holds the potential to be my favorite. Uh, I think the world is beautifully realized. The characters are plentiful and they're really memorable in the same way a Souls game is. 
Uh, it def- the, everything, the, the whole game is kind of dripping with this Souls-like quality, which I think is really cool to see in like a 2D perspective. Uh, the soundtrack is f- fucking phenomenal. In fact, it's the soundtrack I fully intend to purchase the moment I finish this game. Honestly, I really wish I could say more, but I'm afraid I can't, as there's still just too much of this game for me to, to, to see and experience uh, as of yet. But um, let's just say that Hollow Knight left a really lasting impression on me that will likely keep me coming back to this game for months to come in 2018. Okay, we've entered top five territory. Now, I've been a longtime fan of Assassin's Creed. Some might even call me an apologist for the series. Uh, But Assassin's Creed Origins is, in my opinion, absolutely the best game in the series since the Ezio trilogy. I would even call it the best in the series, period, to be totally honest, although the jury's still out on that one. What they've essentially done with this game is completely reinvent the way Assassin's Creed controls, uh, which obviously has a direct impact on the way players play the game. They've thrown out that old, weird, counter-focused combat system of previous games, which is actually really tough to get the hang of, uh, in favor of a more traditional, hands-on approach to combat. Uh, It seems like a simple explanation, but something I really wish they had done years ago. Uh, The effects of that change trickle down and have a major impact on the equipment and loot systems, making this the most RPG the series has ever been. Uh, And it's addicting. Uh, More importantly, it's fun. And this might be crazy, this might sound weird, but for the first time ever, I think I can praise Assassin's Creed for being genuinely fun. Uh, And it's not not like in the acquired taste kind of fun that I think the other games in the series are. Assassin's Creed Origins is a accessible, fun action RPG that I think everyone should try. Uh, Stealth is fun. Open combat is fun. The bow is fun. Exploring is fun. Which, of course, leads me to the, the world of this game, which I think is an incredible achievement. It's, it's a massive open world that's full of treasure, mysteries, beauty, and most importantly, tombs. Like, real tombs. You can wander off the beaten path and discover a tomb in you know a cave or in a pyramid. And you can explore that tomb at your own pace. And I think... And you can find all kinds of things that benefit you as a character. And I think that is super satisfying. It's more of a Tomb Raider game than Tomb Raider is at, at this point. I think one of the really cool things in this game, which you know a lot of pop, a lot of people may not even see, uh, is you can actually hallucinate if you spend too much time in the heat in, in in the desert sun, which is which is really cool. I didn't see this myself, but I heard you can you can sometimes see like an entire swarm of locusts like blotting out the sun if you spend too much time in the heat, which is it's cool. I really wish I had seen that myself. But they incorporated obviously the hunting crafting system from the Far Cry series has been implemented here and it works just as well. Um, the traversing by boat is great. There's a little bit of the Black Flag ship combat sprinkled in. Um, overall, I think everything from top to bottom is a super smart improvement to the series. It also strikes this perfect balance between the history aspect of it and the science fiction aspect, which was divisive, but for those who appreciate it, it's there to discover. Lastly, I think Assassin's Creed Origin tells a really grounded and smartly written story. Uh, perhaps the best story in the entire series, and it's, it's, it's meant to kind of go back and tell you the origins of the Order of the Assassins, which I think is actually really well executed. When you have that moment in the story where you realize, oh, this, what I'm witnessing right here is the birth of the, of the Order, I think is a really well executed moment. I think it also has some of the best characters in in the series since the Ezio trilogy, hands down. I think Bayek is a fascinating character. In fact, I think the relationship between Bayek and his wife Aya is really well done. I was kind of hoping, I think if I had one complaint against the game, I think it would be that I was really hoping it would be kind of like Assassin's Creed Syndicate, where you split your time between Bayek and his wife Aya, but it really doesn't play out that way. Uh, She does play a role, but it's not what I was hoping for. All in all, it's a a really smart tie-in to the rest of the series. It's a great... Uh, it's, it's a great way of setting up the dominoes that, for everything that came afterwards. It also feels like the natural evolution of the series. I'm kind of bummed it took them this long to get to this point, but this feels like the perfect jumping off point for the future of the series. Uh, there's no turning back at this point. Every change they made to this game was for the better. Um, so I guess in closing, I would just say I implore it, those of you out there who maybe appreciate the series but, but gave up on it um, to maybe give this game another shot because I I really think this is a defining moment for the franchise uh, and there's actually potential here going forward for the series to continue in in a positive light so it's easily one of my favorite games of 2017. Coming in at number four is a game I have a huge love-hate relationship with and that's Neo from Team Ninja. I've never been a fan of Team Ninja before 
but I think they absolutely killed it with this game. It's ultimately one of like the densest but most fulfilling Souls-like games I've ever played. And that's including all the Dark Souls games, Bloodborne. Um, it's just so jam-packed full of mechanics that support one another. Uh, Guardian Spirits, weapons, the different stances that you can use for all those weapons. Ninjutsu and Magic, which have their own completely separate skill trees. The Kyburst, which is completely dependent on timing. Consumables, Dojo Training, which is addicting. Side Missions, Kudamas, which give you uh, passive boosts or stat boosts. Summoning help from other players, like any other Souls game. Like, all of these different things, are there are tools that are at your disposal that can be used at any time. It allows for so much variety and experimentation in gameplay. There's also so many different attacks that you can learn in the various skill trees that you literally have to choose which attacks to map to the various controller, the buttons on the controller, because you can't use them all. There could be like four or five different attacks that you can map to holding L1 and hitting X. Um, but it's because of that, it's super flexible and, and fluid to your preferred playstyle. And because of this, I was essentially able to completely avoid huge mechanics that didn't really appeal to my own personal taste, even though they may be integral to other players and their playthroughs. Uh, for instance, like I'm not really into mid-maxing or crafting the way that Brad is, so I was able to completely avoid those aspects of the game. Uh, but there was still so much left, so much there was so much left in my tool belt that that didn't really matter in the end. The game lets you pick and choose what mechanics work best for you, what you enjoy the most, and that kind of player freedom is invaluable. There's so much variety as well in like the level design, thanks to the mission-based structure, because they don't have to worry about how, every how everything connects seamlessly. One mission may be dramatically different than the other. There's also a bunch of side missions. They essentially take the maps that you that you go to in the main story and they, they remix them. They, they add new stuff, they move the enemies around, and they even ch change the times of day. And it ultimately ends up making the game feel like there's a lot more to it than maybe there actually is. And all the while, they didn't sacrifice anything that made Dark Souls so addicting. Uh, it has everything that you love about, like, like that that intensity, that that stress of like trying to make sure you maintain your experience when you die. Um, the you know the brutally challenging boss fights, the really demanding control structure, the the shortcuts, like everything is still super super tight here. Uh, in fact, in many cases, I think I enjoyed this game a lot more than playing a Dark Souls game, especially from a character movement perspective. Like, I think the, I think the character con control and the, the, the freedom you have to move that character around is so much more rewarding in Neo than it ever was in Dark Souls. And I love Dark Souls. On the flip side, I think the game is exceedingly difficult at times, which I know some people really, you know, really appeal to some people, but to some extent, I, I'll have to admit, I think it dampened my enjoyment a little bit. This game could have been my favorite game of the entire year had I not had to like beat my head against the wall to beat a few of the bosses in this game. Um, also, I think the plot's a little hard to follow. A lot of that kind of stems from the fact that it uses it, it's based in Japanese history, so it's there's a lot of Japanese places and, and historical figures whose names I just honestly I can't remember, so I have a hard time following it. Um, but the presentation's there. like The, the cutscenes are great. The set-piece moments are fantastic. And despite all that, this game delivers one of the best action RPG experiences I've ever had. Who would have thought that in 2017, Guerrilla Games, the guys who made Killzone of all things, would deliver my third favorite game of the year? Horizon Zero Dawn is a post-apocalyptic game about fighting robot dinosaurs. And yes, I know that's a bit of a simplification, but that's what it is, and it's amazing. And like Nier Automata, which I mentioned earlier, Horizon Zero Dawn tries to tell two stories. It's trying to tell a more personal, character-driven story uh, about a girl who's been, who, who lives in this tribe, who's been, out, who's been an outcast her entire life because of her, you know, where she came from. Uh, but it's also trying to tell the story about, this grander story about what happened to the world. How did we end up in this, this scenario? What happened? To, what, what cataclysmic event brought humanity to this point? But unlike Nier Automata, it doesn't struggle with that. Both of these stories are equally engrossing and, and, and very successful. Aloy, I think, is a great character. In fact, I think she's one of the best characters of the year, perhaps the genre. Uh, her past and, and, and what led her to being an outcast and, and her interactions with her tribe as she tries to win their favor is really, really good stuff and it keeps the overall the overarching story moving forward. Uh, you, in the course of that, you also learn a lot about these tribes that sprung up all over the world following this cataclysmic event. Uh, and it, all of this kind of ties back in a really nice, neat way into the, the grander mystery of 
how did we end up here in this place? Being a post-apocalyptic game too, the world is obviously very important. Um, but and I'm happy to report this is yet another beautifully designed open world in 2017. It doesn't stray too far from the norm in terms of open world design. I think it kind of plays it safe. But it manages to avoid some of the pit common pitfalls that some, some other open world games suffer from. Uh, and it's largely because it's, it's a vast and absolutely gorgeous world to explore. In fact, I would go as far as saying this might be the best looking game I think I've ever played. There's also no shortage of quests to undertake, people to meet, mysteries to unravel, which kind of leads me to uh, one of my favorite aspects of the game, which is cauldrons. The world is the world itself is very like nature focused. There's lots of trees, lots of greenery, but you occasionally come across these secret underground cauldrons, which are like factories. They're like bizarre science fiction factories where you kind of learn and unravel the mystery of where these robots came from, and that stuff is really interesting as well. And of course, the robots gotta be some of my favorite enemy and creature design in a game ever but actually i think it's it's more involved than that i think it's this game kind of straddles the line between enemy and world design in a, in a way that i haven't really seen before it all feels very cohesive i just love how everything within the world feeds back into this idea of technology and nature kind of becoming one after this uh, apocalyptic event it's it's like a totally convincing science fiction ecosystem the robots all feel like like living breathing parts of the world and 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 humans are so far removed from the past that that robots and actual living wildlife are pretty much indistinguishable to them which i think is a really cool concept that they play with in some interesting ways um all the enemies themselves have these really unique weak spots that are cleverly hidden and really really tricky to exploit in battle uh, in fact taking enemies apart uh is very much akin to um I, I like to compare it to like binary domain if anyone played that game like when you when you shoot robots in that game you have all these like nuts and bolts and panels flying off of them and it's just really uh, like visceral satisfying feedback and this game is very much the same way but combat's also kind of like a puzzle because you're you have to strategically kind of take them apart so you can get cleaner access to their glowing weak weak spots so it's like a puzzle it's like a fast moving aggressive deadly puzzle and seeing as humans have returned to their more primal nature in this game technology is pretty much all but lost you're kind of forced to face these huge robots with you know basically a bow and arrow and let me tell you taking down a huge robot with a bow and arrow is super fucking cool I also really like the tall necks in this game, which is kind of their twist on the standard, like, scale this watchtower to unlock part of the map idea, which obviously became huge thanks to Ubisoft and the Far Cry series. But this game, those towers are like robotic giraffes that walk around parts of the world, and you have to scale their neck and get to the top to, like, hack into their systems, and then which unlocks part of the map and... and Gives you, shows you where hidden items are in the map, but they're often they're often protected by some of the more aggressive enemies in the game, and that that actually adds a whole new dimension to scaling these towers that just hasn't I've, I've never really seen in another open world game before. All in all, I think Horizon Zero Dawn succeeds at delivering a really engrossing story and supporting it via some incredibly satisfying fast-paced combat against robot dinosaurs, which. That's fucking cool. Robot dinosaurs, man. What else do I gotta tell you? I think we have another AAA first-party franchise on our hands. If you missed it in 2017, don't hesitate. This is one of Sony's best new IPs that I'm certain has a really bright future ahead. Coming in at number two is The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. The only game in the Zelda franchise to make me question my love and devotion to one of my favorite games of all time. And let me get this out of the way first, because... The only reason this hasn't definitively become my favorite Zelda game of all time, and dethroned Ocarina of Time on my list of favorite games, is the lack of memorable, distinct dungeons and boss fights. Which, you know, for a Zelda game, seems like a pretty huge deal, but it's kinda not, somehow. That's because the world of Breath of the Wild is built with player freedom in mind. Not only can you tackle the story and dungeons in any order you want, you can explore the world in any order you want. If it pleases you, you can run straight to Ganon and fight him from the get-go. Though that's definitely not recommended. They essentially took player-dictated pacing and objectives to the next level. It kind of feels like the natural evolution of A Link Between Worlds, um, but on a much, much bigger scale. And while I am sorely disappointed in the decisions that were made regarding the main dungeon designs, uh, that disappointment is completely overshadowed by the world that sits before you when you walk out and you see it for the first time. That moment when 
Link wakes up and he, you know, ventures out of the, out of the temple and into the light of day for the first time and sees the vastness of the world before him. That's like that's gonna be burned into my brain for the rest of my days. It reminds me of Fallout Three when you first emerge from the vault. I remember being immediately overwhelmed by the freedom, uh, but totally overcome with you know excitement about what I was about to be exploring. And I have never, ever had as much fun exploring an open world as I did in The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. I think it's, not only is it a hell of an achievement from, you know, just open world game design perspective, like the fact that they fit this on the Switch and made it a kind of a portable experience is absolutely incredible. And I, 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 I can't stress enough how much fun I had playing this both at home, docked to my TV, and on the go. But anyways, back to the world design. There, there are secrets around every turn. Uh, and you learn the rules that that govern the world, not from a tutorial or through you know traditional Nintendo handholding, but through experimentation. It's kind of like you know if you can dream it, you can do it. Uh, the way of things in this world is very similar to the way they are in reality. You know things like that you assume like metal can generate can be used to connect electrical currents, or uh, or rain makes things slippery and hard to climb. It's, you know things like that are all over the place in this game. And it's super impressive, especially when you consider how huge and massive this world ultimately is. I think it honestly is probably in a world in a, in a year full of really, really large, overwhelming open world games. I think Breath of the Wild might be the biggest, most overwhelming. I also really loved how committed they were to the quote unquote wild aspect of the game. Like it's very it's very nature focused and, and Zelda in general is very is known historically for having for you know having really great memorable music which i think this game has but it's been downplayed here quite dramatically in favor of a more ambient soundtrack and 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 it has this like lovely minimalistic score that's that's kind of used that's sprinkled throughout the experience of course um you can climb on everything which is a real game changer uh it makes exploration it, it makes exploration kind of unlike anything i've ever experienced in a game before and on, it's honestly quite the technical feat as well, I'm sure. And while the main dungeons lack some of that personality of other classic Zelda dungeons, uh, the world itself serves as one massive dungeon, and the shrines that are littered throughout are hidden, and they, they kind of serve as puzzles and obstacles that are, you know, just a delight to tackle. In fact, finding all of those shrines is almost as fun and addicting as, you know, any classic puzzle in any classic Zelda dungeon. But lastly, I, I do want to say, because I don't feel like this is going to get mentioned enough, I was in love with the look and presentation of this game's story, uh, which can be revealed in any order, since you can explore the world in any order. It, it, they kind of, all of the cutscenes and all of the, the, the story progression are kind of done through these memories that you unlock, because, you know, Link wakes up at the beginning with amnesia, so you can kind of find them throughout the world and unlock the memories in, in any order you choose, but the cutscenes are gorgeous, they're well acted, and they're easily the best looking the series has ever seen. Um, in fact, this also has my favorite depiction of Zelda in the entire series. But uh, honestly, this is a game that I could talk about forever and ever, so I'm going to stop there. We definitely had our fair share of lengthy discussions on our podcast, uh, and I'm sure anything that I forgot to mention is going to be covered in you know the other videos from the other guys. But uh, the bar has been raised, and like I said with Assassin's Creed Origins, Breath of the Wild is very much a turning point for this beloved franchise, and I cannot wait to see what comes next. All right, we're at number one, and some of you probably saw this coming, as I've been raving about my time with Resident Evil 7 since I wrapped it up in January. And <clears throat> let me just say, I care deeply for this series, and I've developed some opinions about the state of the franchise in recent years. To sum those up, essentially, I miss classic Resident Evil, and despite being absolutely in love with Resident Evil 4, I feel like it set the series on a path to destruction by turning it into basically an action game. And I know those opinions might be upsetting to some of you, and I'm sorry. But, Resident Evil 7, to me, is proof that a happy medium can be found. In a lot of ways, this game feels like it was made for me, like it was a direct acknowledgement of the issues that I've taken with the series in a post-Resident Evil 4 world. It manages to uh, return to the roots of the franchise while also completely turning the formula on its head by changing the perspective uh, to first person and once again steering away from zombies as the primary enemy type. Uh, it even managed to toss in some of that Resident Evil camp and forkiness at the very end and make me love it. In fact, for the first time in quite a while, I feel like the story was better for it because of how well uh, the Umbrella Corporation and military and the bioweaponry bullshit uh, was juxtaposed with the more smaller scale 
uh, authentic like horror experience of the Baker family in the swamps of Louisiana. I think that stuff is fantastic, and I think they play together really nicely. Uh, so essentially, I'm on board again, and I think that's fucking awesome. And the, uh, the the Baker Plantation, I think, will forever remain one of my most memorable and nostalgic places that I've ever spent time exploring in a video game, especially in regards to horror games. I think it's a beautifully constructed and well-designed world with an incredible sense of place. Uh, I loved exploring and learning the layout of the plantation, uh, like the back of my hand, while avoiding the Baker family members and finding keys and solving those obscure Resident Evil puzzles and trying to solve the mystery of what happened to your wife. Um, the combat was rare, but it was, it was welcome, and the feedback you get was so good. Because the combat was kind of sprinkled throughout the experience and, and it wasn't a very action-heavy game, the pacing, I think, was the best the series has ever ever had. But the game really shines thanks to some you know, iconic set-piece moments and a couple standout boss fights as well. Uh, the Birthday Party Escape Room, of course, is a brilliant set-piece and a wonderful break from like the traditional or the typical gameplay you've been doing up until that point in the game. Uh, and I don't think I've ever been more frightened during a boss fight as I was during the fight against uh, Mama Baker. That that fight in and of itself is terrifying. If you haven't played it, you'll see what I mean when you get there. Now, I bet you didn't think I would make it this far without mentioning VR. Fact is, I played the whole game, start to finish, in VR. And I am still adamant that that is definitely the way to play this game if you can. But I also think it's important to note that this would be my game of the year regardless. VR does add an unprecedented sense of immersion that I think controls absolutely beautifully. Uh... And it stands tall as one of the most exciting glimpses into the future of gaming that I've ever experienced. I can't, st I can't stress enough how much I loved playing this game in VR. But the fact remains that Resident Evil 7, to me, feels like a love letter to classic Resident Evil that still manages to embrace what made the more recent games so great as well. And, and it does so in the name of pushing the series forward, and it completely won me over following Resident Evil 6, which I thought for sure would be the end of my love for the series. So as far as I'm concerned... Resident Evil is back on track. I've said it several times in this video, but this is yet another game that has reached a turning point in 2017. In fact, 2017 saved some of my favorite franchises, Resident Evil Chief among them. If you like horror games the way I do, I consider this to be a masterclass in the genre. Uh, not only do I consider this among my favorite entries in the entire series, but it's also my favorite game of 2017, a year that was packed with unbelievable standout games, many of which I sadly didn't get to mention in this video. But hopefully, that's a testament to how much I enjoyed this game. So, if you haven't played it, if you like Resident Evil, or if you've played any Resident Evil game, I implore you to give this game a try. It's so fucking good. Alright, there you have it. Those are my 10 favorite games of 2017. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, this year was absolutely incredible. Like I said, there were so many games I wish I, wish I could have put in this video, but... You can only pick 10, and there were definitely more than 10. Hopefully you guys will join us for another year of great podcasting and broadcasting over at 4PlayerNetwork.com. Peace out.